because I didn't notice the seven Baptist clock on the back wall, but now that I know it's there, we'll be out of time for lunch. <laughs> so people often ask us, why are we making fun of nuns? And we're not making fun of nuns. We're 21st century nuns. We do the work that nuns have done across all religions and all ages. Nuns raise money for the poor and the sick. We raise money for the poor and the sick. Nuns do outreach and education. We do outreach and education. Nuns take vows of chastity. And we raise money for the poor. <laughs> So we actually do have vows, just like every other religious tradition, um, and our vows are to expiate stigmatic guilt, promulgate universal joy through habitual manifestation. Yes, a Catholic wrote that. <laughs> but what that is talking about is to end that guilt that makes us feel like we're not good enough or worthy, or that whatever we are is wrong. That's stigmatic guilt. It's guilt that doesn't belong. It's about, sh uh, it's about spreading joy and love. It's about going out and telling people that they can smile. To look at us, if we can be this crazy, you can be anyone you want to be. <laughs> Have some joy. And habitual manifestation means you've got to do it all the time. You've got to get out there in the community and remind, them, remind yourself. Those vows are something that we all take to heart. And I want to just say quickly that sometimes I forget my vows and speak too quickly. Love you, man. <laughs> so, let's tell you about the sisters. I want to know where we came from. So, we started in 1979 in San Francisco. Three men donned uh, nuns' habits borrowed from the Sound of Music production by the Sugar Plum Fairies in, Sugar Plum Fairies, I did that wrong, in Iowa. And they put them on and marched through the Castro down to the beach in their habits carrying machine guns. Yes, they got attention. And thus, a group was born. Now, inside that group of founders, there was a former Catholic seminarian, there was a sex worker, and there was a performance artist. And they weren't quite sure what they were, what they were going to do, but they knew that they had found something. So they began to organize around sort of political activism. And one of their first fundraisers was for the gay Cuban boat refugees. They raised $1,500 in 1980 for that cause playing basketball with pom-pom routines. That $1,500 in 1980 was a lot of money in those days. Over the time, the sisters have done lots of things. They've ran for president. They've ran for a supervisor in San Francisco, which they almost won. They protested at the Republican National Convention. The story there is they all flew in and put their face on, on the plane and then stepped off to the media attention. But sisters have been involved in gay and lesbian rights for forever. One of the sisters sewed the first gay pride flag. One of the sisters with the face of AIDS on Times, Mag Times, Mag Times Magazine. One of the sisters with the driving force behind the AIDS quilt. And the sisters were the first group to produce a safer sex, plain language booklet to hand out in the community. This was at a time when the government would not talk about safer sex or condoms or any of those. So it was a very big deal, both then and still today. Which kind of brings me up to the point of what the white face is about, the makeup. Well, there's a couple of stories. In fact, if you ask 10 sisters, you'll get 11 answers on why we started at the white face. And there are sisters around the world who still don't do white face, both Australia and England, they don't do the white face. But white face sort of developed for a couple of reasons. One was it was a chance to be in disguise. If you worked for the health department, you couldn't go out and do condom ministry and teach people about safe sex, you'd lose your job. If you worked for any government agency and you were out in a dress, you would lose your job. So it was a way of disguising who you were to do the work. But it was also a chance to be something different. When you put the white face on, it's a canvas. You totally cleared your face and personality. There's something brand new. And from there, you can use all the colors and glitters make yourself into a piece of art that you never knew was there. For many of us, putting on the white face is sort of a transformational experience. Some of us, as soon as you put that layer of white on and you're, you're gone and this new person stands ready to be developed, is the moment that it clicks in. For some of us, it's when we paint on our lips and you know that you have a voice to speak with to the world. For me, it's when I put on my eyelashes and then look up and realize I have all new eyes and see the world. 
There are lots of reasons and lots of ways that you can manifest a sister. I think you want to know about the spiritual path of sisterhood, and so for that, I will tell you my story. So I was born a chubby little gay boy in the woods of Tennessee. I grew up in a Southern Baptist church where I always got in odds with the congregation. I knew there was something real there. I could feel it. I could feel it in my heart. There was a spirit. But I was told the way I was feeling it wasn't okay. And I wasn't accepted. And so it pushed me away from religion for a very long time. As I go up into college, I suddenly found this group called the Deadheads. Now those are people who follow the Grateful Dead on the road. But they also were very embracing of whoever you are and whatever you want to be. And I felt at home, so they became my family. Then I got to the age of 21 where I could go out to the bars and I discovered this world. This world where everyone got to be who they wanted to be. We had our own language. We laughed and we loved each other. And it was safe. And along with that, though, came things like drinking, which I indulged in pretty heavily about five or six nights a week because it was the only home I knew. Over time, they moved into other things to the point that I was addicted to some drugs like crystal meth. When I was able to get clean for that, I moved to Nashville, and my very first meeting was across the street at the Morgan House. Something I'm very thankful for you helping support. So I was still a little bit lost. I didn't know who I was or where I was supposed to be, and I had no spiritual authority. Well, then come along a few friends who introduced me to the Radical Fairies. That's another sermon you'll get another day. <laughs> the Radical Fairies were modern-day hippies who believed in a subject-subject consciousness, not object-object. What that means is object-object means I see you for what I can see of you, and I judge you on that. Subject-subject means I see the real you and who you are inside. And so it was a movement that started at the same time as the sisters. In fact, you know, some of the early sisters were radical fairies. And so I found this place where there was this belief in a spiritual power and of love and the protecting of our, our earth, and that drag was embraced fully and as a part of just who we are. And it was this wonderful thing that I just sort of found a place to belong again. And it was beautiful. And then one day the sisters were doing an auction for a, a, a rural gay men's magazine. And they asked if I would assist. And so they put me in a cow print romper and a bra across my head and sent me forth to help them. It was like a magic moment happened. Suddenly I was connected to the world in a way I'd never been before. I found a place where I could be my spiritual self and feel connected to the world. I found a place where I could do the outreach and work that I felt we were all called to do. And I found a place to be the outlet for the creativity I had tried to force down all those years. And that's why we do call it a calling. It's a calling to do the work we do. I started 13 years ago. In that time, I've been with a group that was sort of across the southeast and midwest with individual nuns that had no home. And then about six years ago, I had the pleasure of getting to know some of the people you see today and founding the group here in Nashville. Since that day, we have grown and done a lot of things. A lot of fundraising. We've raised money for homeless youth, uh, for sports leagues, for people of different colors and genders and gender identities, creating sacred space for people to express themselves, doing HIV and AIDS education, drugs and alcohol harm reduction, and also lots and lots of just being us and political activism. When the Orlando shooting happened, sisters were at the forefront here in Nashville gathering together to create a march through the streets that quickly many people joined in, including Mayor Barry, to make happen. That was a really important time for us because many of us felt so scared and alone. It was like we could be next. The safety that we had built, maybe it was just temporary. It wasn't going to last. So with that, we started trying to discuss who our colleagues were. Now we have a son of a preacher, a singer from the choir, a defrocked minister, fathers, children, grandmothers. We represent all kinds of people who come to this calling. And that crisis sort of drove us together with a new slogan that we keep really true to heart, which is, I see you and I love you. And I've added, I hear you. Because I spent my whole life wanting someone to see me and to love me and to hear me speak and just validate that it was okay to me. 
So today I bring you a group of people that that's our belief in what we take out. And I hope you leave, you take it with you too, and remember, a smile comes back to you.